Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final forum at Fort Hall Forum, our final forum of the season. Um, before we begin, I have just a few announcements. This video is being recorded and will be available for free on YouTube and iTunes University. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's easy enough. You just go to forthallforum.org and click on the YouTube button. And we'll post this forum in just a couple of weeks. If you subscribe to follow us on YouTube, you'll get an alert when we start um, uploading new videos. If you are sharing a comment or question um, with us today live, you uh, should approach either that microphone or that microphone and speak directly into it when the comments and question period begins. That's so uh, not only we can hear you here in the audience, but so we can also pick up your question on video. Uh, I have two announcements to make uh, tonight, two, two surprises, one good and one bad. The bad is Kevin Bankston was in a bike accident earlier this week. He will be okay, but it was bad enough that he requires surgery, so he won't be able to join us for tonight. Uh, the good announcement is that um, the Fort Hall Forum has decided to VJ this, uh, this forum here tonight, so I'm hoping to add to the conversation with pictures and quotes and possibly a little bit of fact checking. Um, we will also be interested in taking your questions by tweet if you would like to. If you want to tweet a question to us, please do so by writing at Ford Hall Forum. And now, don't turn your cell phones off because they're a vital part of what we're talking about here. Uh, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie May Education Foundation, and our partners here at Suffolk University, which, as you know, serves as our home base here at Fort Hall Forum. Uh, the forum also thanks our members, uh, without whom we would not be able to put on these forums. So if you have fun tonight and you enjoy a, a free public forum, please do become a member. Uh, we tucked a little membership envelope into the brochures, which will be uh, forcibly put upon you as you leave. Um, and hopefully you'll put something in it and send it back to us. Uh, for tonight, um, our moderator for this evening is Darmish Darud. Darmish Darud is a master's student at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, studying social media tools and their applications for informal learning. With this, new with in this interest in new media, she also works at the Berkman Center as a research assistant for Yochai Bentler, I, I probably said that very wrong, um, delving into online cooperation. She's the co-founder of Populous, a Knight Foundation-funded project that aims to provide collegiate and small-town newspapers with the tools they need to survive in a Web 2.0 environment. Rude was recently a Knight News Challenge Fellow at MIT's Center for Civic Media. Currently, she is managing startup acceleration at Code for America. How about a big hand for our moderator, Darmish Darud? And I'd like to introduce um, Nico Mealy, who is an adjunct lecturer in public policy, a leading expert in the integration of social media and Web 2.0 with politics, business, and communications. As the Internet Operations Director for Governor Howard Dean's 2004 presidential race, Nico and the campaign team pioneered the use of technology and social media that revolutionized political fundraising and American politics. Later that year, Nico founded Echo Ditto, a leading internet strategy consulting company. Nico has also co-founded GeniusRocket.com, which uses the internet to solicit advertising creative and launched ProxyDemocracy.com, an online resource for proxy voting and shareholder resolutions. Excellent. Thanks for having me. It's a delight to be here. Good to see everybody. Looking forward to questions from the audience and uh, from the internets, the tubes. So my first question for you is, can you describe exactly the uh, phenomenon you talk about in your book, The End of Big? Sure. So I just published this book, The End of Big, for uh, sale for one low price in the lobby. Uh, <laughs> and the book is about my, um, the book kind of grew out of my experience initially in politics. And it's about this tremendous diffusion of power we've seen. Power over the last 35 or 40 years has uh, gone from hierarchical institutions and been diffused to individuals. 
And so what, what do I mean by that, right? If we think about, if I, had, if I had sat on this stage in 1970 and asked you or someone in the audience to describe a computer, you probably would have described something that was institutional in size and scale. It might have filled a room. Uh, a Cray supercomputer from the mid-70s cost about five million bucks base price and was expensive to run and maintain. They were big institutional machines where you would drop off a problem and come back an hour or a day or a week or a month later and pick up the solution. And today, 130 million Americans carry around a smartphone that has essentially the same, if not the great, greater computer computing power than one of these supercomputers. That's not entirely an accident. The first computer science program in the country was, uh, I believe, <laughs> Uh, Sarah can, can uh, fact check me, 1960 at Purdue University. And uh, if you were a computer science uh, major in, this, in the United States in the 60s, you grew up on college campuses in the middle of the civil rights movement and uh, the, the anti-war movement. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak met just days after the Kent State shooting. And there was this sense that if we let computers stay in the uh, in the halls of power in these institutions that that was a bad thing. Uh, there was a guy named Ted Nelson who wrote a book in 1973 called Computer Lib. You can and must understand computers now. And it was about how we have to claim computers away from institutions for individuals so that we can hold power accountable. You can see this through the thread of advertising in, uh, you know, people remember 1984 as the year the Macintosh computer was released. And there was this famous advertisement uh, uh, that ran during the Super Bowl that referenced George Orwell's 1984. And this sense of personal empowerment derived from the computer. And in fact, it's, it's pretty exciting. We've all had, I'm sure, these moments of, uh, of power and excitement from, the, from personal computers, from technology. But what I look at in my book is the way this impacts the institutions of our time. This is some unintended consequences, good and bad. So I look at the impact this has on big news, on journalism, accountability journalism, investigative journalism, holding power accountable. I look at the impact it has on political parties, on big government, on big armies, big universities, and I go through, and each of these is a chapter in the book. There's Big Fun, which is entertainment, music, movie, books, publishing. <laughs> and I have a big publisher. Um, even big manufacturing, big companies. I bought a 3D printer. You know, 1984 is very interesting because Chuck Hall invented 3D printing in 1984. And I have this 3D printer. It's a little bit larger than a microwave. And it sprays plastic into shapes. And so I have two little boys, four and two, very high energy little boys. Uh, we're headed into the summer season. I didn't want to buy new sandals for them because I know they'll grow out of them by the end of the summer. <laughs> and so I tried as kind of an experiment printing sandals and it was really easy to do. Uh, it took, took about six or seven hours, but I successfully printed sandals for my boys. <laughs> and this was exciting, this was really cool, right? My boys may never, may never buy sandals. They may for the rest of their lives think, well, when you need sandals, you print them. But Quite possible. The, the, a couple days after that happened, they came out, there's this guy in Texas who uh, has printed the blueprints to print uh, a, not quite a semi-automatic machine gun, but close, an AR-15 on 3D printers. BBC reported that more than 100,000 people have downloaded the blueprints to print this, uh, this machine gun. And I think that's just a perfect example of the pr promise and the peril of technology that transfers power from institutions to individuals and the way all of our institutions are struggling to figure out what that means. That's the book in short. <laughs> it's called Distributed Defense is the, name of the, uh, is the name of the guy's website if you want to download the blueprints yourself. Print an AR-15. There's also a great article in the current issue of Harper's Magazine about, about that gun. The sandals. I, you know, I usually bring one with me, uh, <laughs> but it's pretty warm out. The boys are wearing them. Uh, and so uh, what I do have, I can show you after, is I printed my iPhone case. 
uh, so you can hold it. It's actually compostable. It's cornstarch, essentially. And so when I'm done, I'll just throw it in the compost. So my next question um, relates to a 2011 article in The New Yorker, where The New Yorker goes through different internet scholars, and they characterize people as better nevers, never betters, or ever wasers, which is to say, are you a techno-utopian, techno-dystopian, or techno-meh? And so my question to you is, which category of these oh, are you? That's a hard question. You know, I love technology. I'm, I'm a, I'm a self-professed nerd. I started my life as a computer programmer. I, my wife will just t complain to you ad nauseum about all the weird gadgets and cables and my obsession with technology and how our <laughs> TV and phones never seem to work because I'm always fussing with them. You know, uh, so I love technology. It's enormously exciting to me. I've been professionally very successful thanks to technology. But at the same token, I'm, I'm increasingly concerned about some of the implications for our technology. Um, I, I don't really blame the technology. In some sense, I blame our institutions. The institutions I just talked about, you know, all these different bigs, they're not, um, it's not like people chose technology over them. In many ways, these big institutions have failed. You know, what killed newspaper, it, the vast majority of the investigative reporting in the country is done by newspapers. Newspapers were in trouble long before the internet came along, thanks to corporate consolidation and increasing pressure for larger and larger profit margins to meet quarterly reports for publicly traded companies. That was, that was the beginning of real trouble for newspapers. And certainly the internet gave, uh, created all kinds of other challenges for newspapers in terms of unbundling, because now you can get your sports without buying your, you know, you can have your dessert without having your, uh, your vegetables. Uh, and additionally, there was this separation of advertising, the main revenue source for most newspapers. Google took over a lot of that. Craigslist took over classified advertising. All of that impacted newspapers. But long before that happened, newspapers were struggling thanks to corporate consolidation and a, and a, and a real push for increased profit margins north of 30% on a quarterly basis. And so, uh, I think the story of our, the decline of our institutions has, in part, encouraged people to look for alternatives. If you look at higher education in this country, the cost of a four-year college degree has skyrocketed, its economic value has plummeted. Uh, you know, there was a Department of Labor study last year that 19% of parking attendants in the United States have a four-year college degree and the requisite debt that goes with it. There's just some fundamental things in our institutions that are broken. And so you combine that with this technology that's been pushed to individuals, and people are opting out and seeking alternatives. And, you know, it's hard to blame them. I don't, uh, I, 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 what I care about, what I care about is that we build alternatives that have integrity. You know, the, the role of some of these institutions in our democracy is quite significant. You know, the, the history of the press and holding power accountable and accountability, accountability journalism, I think is actually an important part of a functioning democracy and an informed citizenry. And so uh, the decline of the press is, is a real problem. On the other hand, I'm not gonna defend newspapers. I think generally they probably should die, right? The business model doesn't make any sense. And, uh, but I don't want to lose sourcing, accountability, integrity, and reporting, deep, long investigative pieces that uh, put, put enormous legal and professional pressure on the people who publish them. All of that is really essential. And so where, am, I a, am I a utopian about technolo technology? I love it, but I also am very clear-eyed about the challenges uh, that building the future is going to entail. I close the last chapter of my book. I open with the, uh, the, the funeral of King Edward VII in 1910. And almost every country in the world went to King Edward VII's funeral in 1910. And almost every single one of those countries was a colony or a monarchy. There were really just three democracies there, the United States, France, and Switzerland. And uh, they had no sense that their time was over. If you read Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, it's this kind of majestic 
opening of the book is about how this big eloquent funeral that was astonishing by every measure and yet it was the last the last moment of the hereditary monarchy in in western history at least and that the, when i went and read like some of the letters these monarchs were writing to each other in 1910 about when our children are the monarchs of europe and the world in 2013 i just felt like a similar kind of disconnect from the trajectory of history in some of the meetings I go to with policymakers in Washington, D.C., or with, you know, in corporate boardrooms, or even, I dare say, in university faculty meetings. I sit there and I think, boy, folks, this is not going to look like this 25 years out. It just is not. It's like this other world is coming. And that is both tremendously exciting and a little dangerous. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I think uh, I could talk about this for a very long time. <laughs> but here we are, your captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think yep. about, I think about like, diplomacy in the State Department. I mean, the State Department was invented for a time before telephones existed, before the telegraph existed. And the notion was you sent somebody you trusted to another country to make decisions on behalf of the nation, right? And now WikiLeaks kind of proved that the whole thing just doesn't make a lot of sense today. And that's not the only example like that. We vote on Tuesday because Sunday is, is church day and Monday is market day and you ride your horse and buggy into town to vote on Tuesday. It's just like a little bit lunatic. <laughs> We have 435 members of the House of Representatives because that's how many chairs fit in the room, even though the size of the average House district has tripled in 50 years. There's, you know, w w the institutions of our time are not keeping pace with the reality of people's lives. And that's, a, that's both, like I say, tremendous opportunity and a tremendous challenge. So going forward, you've talked a bit about in 25 years, the conversations will be different. But I'm curious your perspective on things like newspapers or record labels. Will these institutions disappear entirely and have their revenue slowly get distributed out so much that the, an organization of that size just can't compete with the little guys? Or is it going to taper down to a very downscaled version of these companies? Well, the argument I make in my book is that it is, um, it's very hard to get any scale unless you're a platform for lots of little things. And so there are what I call in the book the even bigger six companies, if you include Twitter, which is marginal, that's seven, that kind of control our online life. Apple, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Google, Skype, which is how Microsoft sneaks in, and Twitter. And uh, those are very big companies, but they're built on what we call the long tail of participation. All of them need millions of people and customers to participate to work. And that's a, that's a different kind of model. So we're gonna have some big things. There are some new big institutions, but the old models of the past, I'm not sure they work at the same scale given this technology. Newsrooms are a great example. Uh, if we think about the, so the, I said already, the vast majority of the investigative reporting is done by newspapers. Even in the studies that have been done, when you, look at, when you look at TV and radio reporting, it is substantially derived from newspaper reporting. And, um, it, you know, newspapers have two sources of revenue. 80% of their revenue is from advertising and 20% is from subscriptions. And that just, that just doesn't work in the digital age. It doesn't work at all. And in fact, it's not just the way you make money as, as, a, as a news entity, because I hate using the word newspaper, because that forces us into a fairly rigid way of thinking. So it's not just about the uh, ways you make money, it's also about the ways you make the news. There was a market, take WikiLeaks, a major story, and there was a market difference between how The Guardian in the UK handled it and the New York Times handled it. The New York Times put a giant team of reporters and researchers on it to read the cables. The Guardian opened it up and invited their readers to read the cables and help them figure out what the important stories were, right? That's just a, that's just a very different approach to the production of news, to the 
reporting of news, and it requires a very different scale. The Guardian is a relatively small news organization, but has disproportionate reach online because it's able to take advantage of both uh, the, the, this kind of distributed uh, diffusion of power I talked about from big institutions to individuals. It's able to take advantage of that both for the production of news and the distribution of news with, sig with, significant, with significant results. When I think about the future of news, I'm excited. I think there's, there's a very exciting time to be a journalist, but none of those jobs look like a traditional newspaper newsroom with a beat and an editor. And what I care about is all of the values that have been built up around journalism, the professionalization of reporting, the fact-checking, the integrity, the having more than one source before you report it, anonymity of sources, that long tradition, which is very hard won in American history, uh, that's important stuff we have to figure out how to maintain, even as we move to new models that may not look anything like the old ones. Record companies is a lot harder. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was writing the chapter on Big Fun, I was talking, I talk about how there's like an organizational layer. If you think about creative media, fun stuff, movies, music, publishing, uh, TV shows, you have uh, creative people making them, and then you have the audience consuming them. And there's like this organizational layer in between the creative people making them and the audience consuming them that helps to pay for it, find talent, uh, do the distribution to make sure people can get access to it. And um, all, that organizational layer in every, in e by every vehicle, by every measure is totally under attack, right? I mean, the very fact that Netflix has two of the most popular shows, TV shows this year, it's not, it has, that they've never actually appeared on a television channel. There's no advertising, it's all via subscription. They release the entire season at once so you can sit there, st stay up all night and watch House of, Car House of Cards or Arrested Development. That's like a sea change in the way we make and consume our, our entertainment. And the interesting thing was when I, when I went to uh, Hollywood in the music industry and I was looking for people to talk to me about, I was basically looking for someone to come to defense of the blockbuster. I couldn't find anybody. I talked to like heads of record labels and studios. They're like, well, we're making a lot of money, but I'm not sure what else we're really bringing to the process here. <laughs> Uh, but, and they've, they, I think they feel like they've done a bad job. In 1981, the top 10 highest grossing movies in the United States, uh, I think it was seven or eight of them, the major, vast majority of them were original scripts, original stories, original characters. And in 19, uh, sorry, in 2011, 30 years later, the top 10 highest grossing films Every single one was a remake or a sequel, not a single original character or script. And so that's kind of like a failure of our creative industry to do anything creative. It's no wonder people are going to YouTube and, you know, uh, and, and random documentaries on Netflix and people are hungry for alternatives. And my, that's good, right? My real question is what gets lost? What, is there any, anything dangerous we're gonna lose? And I, can't, I came up with three, three things I think we might lose in the entertainment and the loss of big fun. Uh, one, which is kind of debatable, which is uh, one of the recording executives I talked to said, um, when you're looking at, a, when you're watching a movie and there's a beautiful score, do you care if it's an orchestra or if it's totally digital made on a computer? You won't really be able to tell a difference how much do you care about the difference? Because that has a demonstrable impact of the cost of the production. And it, when we move away from bigger budget and different kinds of models for distribution and production, we're not gonna be able to afford those kinds of luxuries. Okay, first of all, I could imagine ways we might be able to afford them. And second of all, I'm kind of a nerd. I'm sure that someone somewhere, I'm sure that you know a symphony lover somewhere dies when I say, every time I say this, but I'll take the digital version if it'll save me some money, <laughs> right? Um, so, I mean, I could imagine situations where I wouldn't be happy with that. I love poetry. I love poetry. I talk about that in the book. But 
Broadly speaking, that feels like a solvable challenge to me. The greater challenge is that in 1967, one of the top 10 highest grossing films in 1967 was Guess Who's Coming to Dinner about interracial marriage. And at the time, interracial marriage was illegal in more than a dozen US states. And here, in every movie theater in the country, was a movie designed to, a powerful story designed to tap into a public moment and to encourage a kind of public conversation. And that's what I think worries me a little bit more is a loss of a shared public space. If all of us go home and we all watch something different tonight during primetime TV, there is like a loss of shared cultural experience. Uh, I've been uh, adjunct faculty for almost nine years, first at Johns Hopkins and now at the Kennedy School. And I used to, when I was teaching at Johns Hopkins, I used to start my class, I do a survey, and ask people about their primary source of news. And a decade ago, it was, you know, you could kind of, it was like the New York Times and the Washington Post. But six years later, 50 students, there wouldn't be a single thing that five of them actually all read. It was like this giant splintering. Yeah, and, and even if you're on Twitter, you're following different people. Yeah. I would say Twitter is my main news source, but and so that has an we don't impact follow on our the politics. same people. Yeah, there's a great book called The Filter Bubble by Eli Pariser where he talks about taking that even up a notch about the personalization of the web, about when you're on Facebook and when you, go if you and I both Google something, we'll get different results uh, because Google is trying to figure out who we are as a person and what we want. But that means that that's a loss of shared public experience, and that has a real impact on our politics. Definitely. So to change the subject a little bit, um, since I happen to be an individual, and according to your book, I am all-powerful, I was wondering if you could uh, coach me a little bit on how to increase my, my powers. Like, should I increase my programming skills? Should I think about generating more followers on Twitter? Yeah. Should I think about, you know, products to launch on Kickstarter? And that'll be the launch of my, uh, my new, new power. Coach me a little bit on how to leverage this as an individual. Well, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I definitely think there is a, there's kind of increasingly a requisite level of, of digital literacy people need to have to be successful. Uh, or, to, or to have power. You have to understand at least something about what's going on. And um, a lot of the ways of learning that is just by trying it, right? You just go fool with it. You know, it's the mm -hmm. monkey approach. Fiddle with it until yeah. you figure it out. But I also think that uh, thinking about yourself as, as powerful is important. Dan Gilmore, in trying to explain to journalists a decade ago, not about a decade ago, what was happening in journalism, said they're not the audience anymore. They're the former audience. You know, when I think when you think about your role as a consumer of anything, as a citizen, as a, as a parent in, in, in a school, you have a lot of power. And you have to understand that power. You have to think about ways to wield it responsibly. I recently spoke to a conference of um, high school principals. And, the, you know, the, their big concern is that at every parent-teacher conference and every PTA meeting, a parent can walk out of it and put on Facebook or Twitter a report of very public, a public report of very private conversations and cause all kinds of havoc for them. It's, it's a significant issue because it erodes their authority and their ability to lead schools. But I think that's kind of the reality of leadership today is that you have to think about leadership as a shared experience. And people, those of us who are leaders in our communities, we have to think about that. We have to think about our leadership differently. And people who are participating in, in more casual ways, you have a lot of power and you need to consider it and think about ways to wield it and use it for the forces of good. So then what should companies be looking out for? If I'm, say, the owner of a big company, what are the main things I should watch out for and what are the ways that I could potentially, of course, only to use my powers for good as this big company, but Hey, we, we had an example the last two weeks, right? Anybody see this footage of the McDonald's shareholder meeting? where this girl, was she seven or nine years old, seven, eight or nine years old, little girl stands up and says to the CEO of McDonald's, how come you're making the children of America fat? And he has the gall to say from the stage, we don't serve junk food. 
what is going on? And of course, it was a viral sensation. But who wins in that exchange, right? When the YouTube video goes viral, the CEO of McDonald's saying that McDonald's isn't junk food is not the one who wins, right? And I was like, oh man, he misjudged that one pretty bad. I mean, I think that uh, in my book, I'm not, I'm not, I am neither sympathetic nor optimistic to about big companies. You know, uh, the American, in 1820, in 1820, the vast majority of the American workforce, I think it's like 87%, something like that, was effectively self-employed as a subsistence farmer or a small shopkeeper or shop hand. I mean, everybody worked in very small enterprise. And 100 years later, by 1920, it's the inverse. 75 plus percent of Americans work for big corporations. And today, we're, the pendulum is swinging back the other way. There are more and more Americans, uh, I think it's the, it's the most Americans self-employed or sole proprietor or employed by small business than at any time in American history since approximately the Civil War. Right, and and now there are that number gets a little fuzzy because technically Walmart is one of the largest employers in the country, but the vast majority of their employer employees are 1099 contract employees, and so. But even if you make massive assumptions about contractors and what have you, the not the majority yet, but a giant number of Americans are self-employed in one form or another, and you know people are probably familiar with the work of Daniel Pink and his work, uh, his his books books kind of documenting that trend over the last decade, and. Uh, even I tell the story about in Lexington, I live in Lexington and I go to my son's preschool parent night and I sit next to this couple who looks unusual for Lexington because they seem like my kind of people. And uh, it turns out that they design laptop decals, print them at home on special vinyl and 3D printers. And also they make docs, iPhone and iPod, iPod docs. And they sell them on Etsy and, and on the web. And they make a pretty good living. And I thought, wow, that business was impossible a decade ago, right? Or, you know, just impossible that you could have a small business like that out of your home and have enough scale to be, uh, to have any quality of life. So that's kind of exciting. At the same time, they have no health insurance, no retirement. They work seven days a week. You know, it's, they are, they are their own accounting, marketing, logistics, packaging, postal, like you name it. This is their small business. And Hey, I'm a small business owner. That's the nature of small business. But that's a, that's a dramatic change, change in the shape and direction of the American workforce over the last 50 years. Dramatic. And I think it has major implications for, for big companies. Uh, there's, a, there's a fellow at Harvard Business School, uh, Ma Max, Maxwell Wessel, who talks about the commoditization of scale, that smaller companies can be competitive with much bigger companies. That it used to be you wanted to get big for certain advantages to the supply chain or pricing or, or different advantages to scale. And a lot of those advantages are increasingly collapsed. They're not gone away. I'm not gonna be naive and say they're gone away, but much smaller firms can be competitive against much larger firms in pretty much every sector. Part of the book research, I was looking at how many car companies there are in America. And you know, everybody thinks, oh, there's three American car companies. Actually, there's a couple hundred, a lot of them making small run bespoke automobiles, you know, small manufacturing runs. And a lot of them are very expensive automobiles for collectors. But that was, that was unimaginable 25 years ago that you could, you could you know, make cars with a, in a small machine shop with precision and impressive technology. And yet today, that's increasingly possible due to a wide range of digital technologies, including 3D printing and on-demand fabrication. So even in the book I look at, uh, I also look at, you know, part of the trend is the commoditization of scales and the way small companies are competitive with big companies. But another part of it is collaborative consumption, right? Uh, car sharing, bike sharing, CSAs, food, sh food f crop, crop mobs to help small farms harvest. Uh, the number of CSAs in this country in the last 10 years has exploded. An order, actually two or three order of magnitudes increase in the number of CSAs in this country. In really every sector, there's this enormous change in, 
in, or enormous change. And in some sectors, it's, it's just starting and it's hard to see. In other sectors, it's very advanced. And um, in a lot of ways, I think it's exciting. I think that given kind of the realities of climate change and what it's going to take to bring down carbon emissions, we have to pursue some alternatives. We got to get it, we got to get back to the small and more local food. It's going to become an economic necessity. It doesn't take much for the increase in the price of gasoline to make those grapes from Chile in your grocery store really expensive. So I have one last question before we take questions from the audience. Um, and that is given that um, as citizens or buyers or individuals, uh, we have a lot of power. What are the best steps we can take to edge towards the um, hopefully more techno utopia than dystopia or um, never better in the uh, words of the New Yorker? Never better. Uh, I have a few suggestions that are, I'll be honest, it's like the weakest part of the book right? It's very easy to talk about what's going on, and it's very easy to be negative about it, to, and it's very easy to be very positive about it, but to get to a balanced place and to think about how we can really have impact here, that's a, that's a challenge. I think the first thing we can do is all of us can be better informed about the impact of this technology. Um, you know, the, I mentioned The Filter Bubble is an excellent book about personalization. Um, uh, I think, you know, just experimenting yourself with Twitter and Facebook, taking a critical eye towards it is useful. There's an excellent book by a woman named Rebecca McKinnon called Consent of the Network about the rise of these bigger tech companies and their power. Um, it's kind of a pity Kevin isn't here tonight. We we're going to talk, uh, when he was going to join us, we were going to talk a lot about some of the legal implications from First Amendment and free speech concerns to uh, a whole wide range of issues. A couple, a couple issues ago, The New Republic had an interesting article by Jeffrey Rosen called The Deciders about the 25 to 28 year olds at Facebook and Google who decides what constitute free speech. And so there's a whole range of interesting issues there to be, to be looked at and addressed. So the first thing we can do is we can learn more and we can be better informed about this. You know, I like to say that, you know, if you, in your automobile, pretty much everybody has a vague notion of how a car works. You put gas in, the gas combusts, and then pistons happen or something that creates energy the forward motion to the car right when you the brakes the brakes like grab the wheels right and s slow the wheels down i mean people have a notion of how cars work however primitive it may be uh and uh and yet yet people will abdicate anything about technology one of my pet peeves is that I have to go to the genius bar at the Apple store. It just perpetuates a ludicrous, dangerous myth of nerd superiority. It's really bad. And I have watched, I've watched major CEOs of big corporations who make hard and smart decisions every day, who have tons of common sense, totally abdicate all common sense in the face of a technology. Like, oh, okay, I guess we'll do that. No, no, we have, to, we have to bring attention and common sense to our technology. We have to think about what kind of world we want to live in and bring that to our technology. So the first thing we got to do is really understand it a lot more. Be, be well educated in this, in this space. The second thing I think we have to do is really demand that our leaders are, are, are well educated in this space, because I, I don't think they are for the most part. You know. I, I don't know this because no one will really tell you, but I bet you could count the number of US senators who have ordered a present for someone on Amazon on one hand, right? I think they just are, you know, this is, there's this famous story about George Bush the first in 1988 on a presidential campaign seeing a supermarket scanner and being like, this is cool, when did they get these? Oh, 25 years ago. Right? I mean, I think there's an element to that, that our leaders tend, especially our political leaders, frequently live in these bubbles, right, have no, uh, have no sense of the shape and force and direction of the world. And so we have to get educated. We've got to demand that our leaders are educated. And then we really have to think about this power people carry. You know, I think that there is this growing gap. I think that social media and the, the power of technology and society is rushing in one direction. And our institutions are like ignorant of it in some sense. Mm -hmm. And we're all in Boston. We had the Boston bombing here a month ago. I was sitting in my office in Harvard Square. And, uh, 
you know, it was kind of a perfect example of this. On the one hand, it was exceptional. I could go right on Facebook and Twitter and tell all of my friends and family that I was safe. I have these, this Italian aunt in Queens who gets very anxious sometimes. So she could right away see I was safe. And uh, I could call my wife, make sure she was safe with my mobile phone to her mobile phone. Uh, but at the same time, there's this rumor getting retweeted on Twitter. There's a bomb in Harvard Square, and half an hour later, a security guard comes and tells me I have to get out of my office because they're evacuating my building. And, uh, and then we watched this thing where lots of people were just deeply distressed and moved in real ways by this bombing and wanted to do something. And they did a lot of different things. Some of them started fundraising online for victims, for the most part, outside of any traditional charities. Uh, some of them w started crowdsourcing a hunt for the bombers, looking through photos, and tragically misidentified suspects, right? At the same time, our big institutions, our authorities, the FBI, the Boston police, they did an exceptional job, but they were, they were just like operating in a different world from the internet. <laughs> and it's that gap that, is, that, that I, I, I think we need to figure out how to close. And closing that gap means sometimes building new institutions. You're starting this accelerator at Code for America. That's building a new institution, a critical one, to try and close that gap. Um, some of it is reforming existing institutions, getting inside of places and trying to understand how can we make the technology, you know, how do, how do we think about the people we're serving as having more power than we as an institution have? You know, those are, those are the kinds of things we need to, we need to be doing. I'm a little long-winded. I'm not sure. Kevin would have gotten a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to take our first question from Twitter. And then if anyone else with a question wants to either tweet at Ford Hall Forum or come up to one of these microphones, we'll take your question next. Hang on. <laughs> I'm at Nico, N-I-C-C-O on Twitter. If you want to find me and if I have you, as the audience, have more power than me. If I've said something totally wildly inaccurate, you can come at me. Darmishta, we've, we've have people here who are tweeting the forum, but no questions yet. So you are, in, in Twitter, you are under the cover of, of a disguise. Feel free to tweet in a question, no matter how obnoxious. We don't know who it is. That's the fun of the internet. <laughs> Well, here we can take some questions IRL, which is short for in real life, if you guys aren't up on your internet slang. <laughs> I was just going to say I'm choosing not to Twitter right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fascinating speech uh, presentation and also excellent facilitation. Um, how do you feel about MOOCs? And that's the massive open courseware that you know, MIT and Harvard started. And how does that fit in with your um, premises in your book? That would be, uh, I believe, Chapter 7, Big Minds. So, I teach at a big university. <laughs> um, when I was at Johns Hopkins, they asked me to teach online, and I taught online for a year. Uh, I found uh, I didn't like teaching online. What I love about teaching is relationship with students, is the classroom experience. Mm -hmm. It's exceptional. And teaching online was not nearly as much fun as sitting in a room and arguing with kids who think they're smarter than me. And, uh, and sometimes they are. Uh, but, you know, I just missed it. And it was like all of the work of grading papers and with none of the fun. Uh, and so at the same time, so let's say my caveat is I love teaching. I love the classroom. I'm never going to want to teach online. I'm always going to want to teach in a classroom because that's what excites me. And um, uh, by the same token, I think education is really, really Higher ed is in really bad shape these days, mm -hmm. you know? I think it's Houston Community College has 60,000 students. I mean, we, we are teaching, people are running up giant debt to go to school for four years and not get satisfying jobs. And, you know, the whole system just doesn't make much sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the one hand, I, I think, yeah, well, 
if my classroom experience is really passive, if it's just about me lecturing, watch the YouTube video. It's this, you know, that, you know, you may as well, right? By the same token, uh, if my classroom experience is about discussion and trying to learn how to think about things and, and me as the teacher to get as excited and engaged by the, by the discussion as the students, that's just a whole different ball of wax. You know, so on the one hand, I think the price of education, I have tons of stats and details in my book about how out of control it is and how it really, it's dramatically outpaced inflation. The, a ton of it is related to capital expenses of building new expensive buildings. You know, the, the, whole, the whole pace and direction of it, I just think in higher education broadly, broadly makes no sense and is needs it needs a disruption you know sebastian thrun was one of the top rated professors at stanford he's a tenured professor of robotics left two years ago to teach his course online through a startup i can't remember if his is udacity i think it's udacity it is and uh and he said i you know i'd rather teach 150,000 students than 150 and i don't have to go to faculty meetings this way and so I was like, well, that, that has some appeal, right? Uh, but the, um, so I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. I feel like educate, higher education in this country has dramatically failed. On the other hand, uh, higher education carries some really valuable things. It carries this classroom experience and actually teaching kids to think. It carries uh, credentialing. I don't really want to see a surgeon who got their degree online. Uh, basic research is an essential part of uh, of universities, like, you know, a ton of basic research for the world happens inside of the world's biggest universities in a really crucial and uh, essential way. Peer review provides integrity to a lot of that research. You know, there's a lot of core values in universities, but the they they are that they are designed that way because a long time ago you had to have all there weren't that many books so you put all the books in one place right and well that's not how the world works anymore i i tell my one of my classes is a kind of a digital literacy class and i tell all my students they have to create an account on wikipedia and add and add something of value to wikipedia and i am intentionally provocative to them saying 25 years from now your Wikipedia reputation might be more valuable and a better credentialer than your Harvard diploma right, right? and yeah, there's some hyperbole there but I'm trying to communicate to them that that there are other credentialers now actually you know Doris Kearns Goodwin is the great historian uh, of Lincoln and yet she would have no credibility inside of Wikipedia's ecosystem to edit the impressive article on Lincoln Right, And so um, when we look at all these kind of important core values that are bundled in higher education, well, if higher, what is the purpose of higher education? Why do we send people to school for four years? What do we really want out of that experience? What should that experience look like? What should it cost? Who should it be available to? Those are like the important questions we have to get to. And the disruptive nature of online education with things like MOOCs is a way of, um, is a symptom of a larger crisis rather than a problem in and of itself. You know, very interesting. Uh, um, I'm not. I'm going to blank now. But what is this? Uh, this public university in New Hampshire that is the largest online it, public university of Southern New Hampshire. University yeah. of Southern New Hampshire is a relatively small physical campus, but the largest online public university. And the cost differential is gigantic. To get a four-year degree online from the University of Southern New Hampshire is about a quarter of the price of going there physically. And what are they using a lot of the revenue? Because it's very lucrative online education. They're using it to build a very impressive campus and a great gym. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I get in trouble someone from the University of Southern New Hampshire on the internet now. But Thank you very much. My pleasure. Why don't we take a question on this side, and then after that, we'll take any from the internet if anyone's tweeting. You've invited response to anything you may have said here yes. tonight that is outrageous. Please. Well, you did in your reference to George Bush the first in the alleged supermarket scanner incident. Okay. It was not 88, it was 92. 92, thank you. And furthermore, the whole thing is baloney. Okay. As explained, but just go to snopes.com, they'll, they'll knock it down. It's been knocked down a thousand times at least, over and over again. 
Even Mary Matlin and James Carville, that well-known right-winger James Carville, in their book, Knock It Down. The culprit was Andrew Rosenthal of the New York Times who ran that phony story. It had, what it had to do with was technology which was not on the market at that time. It was not basic scanner technology that George Bush had never seen before. So I'm, terrible, I'm amazed that you haven't heard of the fallacious nature of this. Well, the fact that you haven't, I'll, I'll, I'll resist the impulse to discount everything else you've said here tonight based on that alone. <laughs> I stand totally corrected. <laughs> And I will, uh, and Snopes is a great site for debunking these things. So I had no idea that that, was, that wasn't true, and I will totally retract it. And I, you know, I think it speaks to, uh, you know, it speaks to kind of one of the great things about the internet is its ability to self-correct in that sense, to, 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 to correct articles that are wrong. Snopes is a great debunker of things, but given that that myth was, you say, was perpetrated by the New York Times, yeah. The before fact that, the internet got rolled. Before the uh, internet ever existed. In fact, William F. Buckley gets credit for being the first one to knock it down. Excellent. So let's give him credit. Good. But the fact that you're a Howard Dean leftover, and I see references here to climate change and uh, uh, an applause for WikiLeaks, I, I, you still have this liberal agenda, I take it. And is this, is this uh, something that's common among you folks in your field? I, I hope there are enough people on the other side of the political aisle that you are well aware of who are fighting the good fight with this technology from the other side of the political fence. You, you do acknowledge that. So since we have these two competing forces, nothing really is going to change, is it? Well, so many ways to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, there's actually an excellent article in the last issue of The New Yorker about the politics of Silicon Valley and the politics of technology because I don't think it falls into traditional liberal or conservative camps. Uh, while Silicon Valley has been a big funder of Obama, they're also a big funder of Rand Paul. There is a, the, uh, the core part of my book is a deep-seated libertarian instinct and thread to technology that I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to. I, I think the, you know, I'm, I think it's the monitoring of U.S. citizens and the press by the executive branch by the Obama White House is outrageous. And the, uh, the way the Obama administration has just really pioneered uh, aggressive executive power and, uh, and executive privilege, especially in wiretapping. You know, the FBI has a new pro proposal out, out of the Obama administration to allow warrantless eavesdropping on email accounts. I just think it's, it's a totally unacceptable and absolute perversion of power to, to allow that kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm not at all uncritical of power. We must hold power accountable. That's what I care most about, is the ways we hold power accountable with integrity. And what I worry most about in our institutions is the way they fail to hold power accountable with integrity and the way that technology could encourage that but could also further obscure that. That's, that's the challenge. I will say, to kind of change gears a little bit and just talk real politics, you know, uh, part of the way I started writing the book was thinking about, um, was just a thought experiment about, uh, you know, Howard Dean was this outsider running against the establishment. The, every other president, every other Democratic presidential can, candidate in 2003 uh, had their campaign headquarters in Washington, D.C., and Howard had his in Burlington, Vermont. And every other Democratic presidential candidate in 2003 had gone on the record in support of the Iraq War or voted for it. And Howard had gone on the record against it. He's the only one who was really outside of the establishment in a substantial way. And that proved to be a crucial engine of the campaign, is that Democrats felt like the Democratic establishment had abandoned them. And they wanted to challenge the establishment very similar to what I think is happening with the Tea Party and the Republican Party today. That the Tea Party feels like the Republican establishment has abandoned it, and they're challenging it pretty successfully. And, you know, so here's Dean challenging the Democratic establishment with Democratic activists behind him, 
And uh, you fast forward to 07, and here's Obama running against Hillary Clinton. Now, Hillary and Bill Clinton had built the modern Democratic Party. It was like their party. He had been president for eight years. He's one of the most popular Democrats. He's certainly the most popular living Democrat, probably one of the most popular Democrats of all time. Hillary had worked on every presidential campaign race since she was, you know, in college. She, this was her turn. It was her time. Uh, and uh, if you go back to even 90 days prior to the Iowa caucus, the press is very bullish on Hillary. They think she's just going to steamroll her to victory. She's unbeatable. And, and yet, a man who'd been in public life less than a decade defeated her. This woman who she and her husband built the party. And they were able to defeat her because, uh, I argue in my book, because the Democratic Party had kind of atrophied. It, had got, it was no longer a real grassroots organization. It was primarily a vehicle for raising money for major donors. And so if you, like Obama, were able to raise money outside of a major donor fundraising uh, system, you could be very competitive and even take down the heir apparent. And I see a similar kind of dynamic at work in the Tea Party, uh, that the Tea Party is raising money uh, online to challenge the Republican Party. We've had uh, uh, at least five sitting U.S. senators challenged in their own primaries by the Tea Party, uh, mostly successfully. You know, the, uh, every, single, every single Republican senator uh, is laying awake at night worrying that they're going to have a Tea Party challenger and, uh, and, and lose. And I think that that just speaks to kind of the failure of the political parties in this country, that people feel like they don't actually serve the constituents, that they serve uh, a handful of special interests, and the process is just radically broken. So any Twitter questions yet? No, but I want to encourage you to be shy. Usually I say don't be shy and walk up to the mic. I want to encourage you to be shy. Just tweet it to me. I don't know who you are. <laughs> oh, it's at, I'm sorry, at Ford Hall Forum. So we'll alternate. We'll take one from this side, and then we'll come back to, back to you. I, I think she was there first. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Elsa. I'm actually a joint degree student at the Kennedy School and the Business School. So good to see you, Professor. You should take my class next fall. I, I will. I'm at, I'm at the DPI 659. Thank you. <laughs> That's a course name. Um, so I want to hear your comments on uh, a thought that I have. Is that, is it really the rise of individuals or is that something else? So I'm imagining it could be two things. So either the rise of individuals because of the empowerment of, of the internet, we think it's the wisdom of the crowd, but it's actually the rule of the mob. Um, and how do we, if that's the case, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Because the diffusion of power can also be chaos. And the second scenario of that diffusion of power is that this rise of individual could just be an illusion. And I'll give you an example why I thought that way. Um, so. Of, a couple months ago, um, Eric Schmidt came to the Kennedy School. He was a former CEO of um, Google. And one of the questions that he took uh, uh, from the audience, the student began by saying, Mr. Schmidt, it's an honor to have you here. We've got lots of heads of states who've come to the Kennedy School to speak, and you're the most powerful one. And so what he's trying to say is that this is a company this man is unelected, but he wields so much power over information, not just in the U.S., but also in the world. So is the rise of individuals actually an illusion of the fact that those people who provide the infrastructure for these individuals, they are the ones who hold more power? So how, how would you feel about these yeah. two scenarios? Of, so you know? I would say in my book, I, I talk about it as the end of big institutions, traditional big institutions. But I absolutely, there's an asterisk and caveat that there are some bigger institutions that are new and being created, right? The even bigger I cited before, Apple, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Google, uh, Skype, and Twitter. Although Twitter, I don't put in the book because it's not really that big, but it seems to have a growing and disproportionate impact. So I do think there is absolutely, um, you know, like in American history, Never before has so much public space been privately owned, if you think about the digital, the digital space. 
And I do think that those, uh, I do think that those companies have an enormous amount of power and influence, enormous. Uh, but I would offer a couple of, a couple of, you know, caveats or asterisks, right? One is that um, if you really want to read a book about that, go read Rebecca McKinnon's Consent of the Network, because that's really what she's interested in, is the power of those big companies uh, to make decisions that in the past would have been the decisions of a nation state, undoubtedly, right? Uh, and that's why the title of the book is Consent of the Network, because if you think about Locke and kind of traditional political philosophy, governments operating with the consent of the governed, she says that these big internet companies operate with the consent of the networked, right? That uh, Google's able to have that power because so many people use it. They buy ads on it, they, they blog in a way that helps create the authority that the algor search algorithm requires. So many people search. I, I also think that um, these big companies, so, that, that's the best in-depth discussion of that is in, is in her book. But I also think that these big internet companies are relatively fragile, all things considered. That the two biggest internet companies 10 years ago were AOL and BlackBerry, right? I mean, AOL bought Time Warner, right? And when I look at what's required to challenge these companies, it's not like you have to be Walmart and build giant... Uh, build stores in every zip code in the country, it's actually in some ways a pretty low barrier to entry that some smart kids with some good computers and a little bit of money can mount a credible challenge. That, the, the fact that, the fact that uh, if, if, I had said to, if I had said to you, if I had said to Henry Ford, ah, five 21 year olds and a hundred grand good and some servers, they, they, you know, they really would take down Ford Motor Company. That would have sounded crazy. But if I talk about that and say, do you want to invest in this company going after Google? You know, you, you, wouldn't, throw that, you wouldn't throw that idea out as ludicrous, right? Something about the scale of power and the, 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 the fragile nature of it is... Uh, so I don't want to diminish the power those companies have. Those big companies have enormous power. But I also think that it's not as monolithic as it seems. Um, they're certainly doing everything they can to try and make it so. <laughs> but um, but there, there's plenty of opportunities to disrupt it, uh, undoubtedly. Can you comment on the possibility of the rule of the mob? Yeah, so I actually talk a little bit about this in, in my book, that I think there is... Uh, there is a real danger that what I, when I was talking earlier about institutions, what I care about is that they bring integrity to process. Mm -hmm. Because if we're gonna have any kind of politics, if we're gonna have disagreements, if we're gonna make policy in this country, we need a process that has integrity to work out our disagreements and to come to compromise. And um, that's in some sense the purpose of government and maybe even politics. And when in, in my chapter on big government, I open with this story about, um, I mentioned before I have these two little boys, very high energy, and we uh, go to this playground that has a giant slide. It's like a three-story slide. And I love it because I just stand at the bottom of the slide and the boys come down and say, yeah, run up the three flights of stairs again and go down. And like, do that again, do that again. Another 10 times, exhaust yourself. And um, during the a hurricane, I think maybe it was Hurricane Irene, I can't remember, the, they got destroyed. Robbins Farm Park slides, they got destroyed. And the city said, the town of Arlington said it was going to be, you know, uh, I can't remember what they said, like three years and $25,000 to replace the slides. And there's a whole bunch of parents who need the kids to run up those stairs and get exhausted, right? It's like every parent in the neighborhood was like dismayed. And so some parents started a PayPal page and then put up flyers on all the trees and said, if every parent who comes here gives 100 bucks, we'll raise the money overnight to build the slides. And sure enough, a few weeks later, they raised the money, they built the slides. And they, they, they didn't have to wait three years. Sounds like a great story. But to me, it raises a bunch of questions we have a local city government for a reason. 
They make budget allocations by a process. And maybe the process is broken. Maybe they didn't communicate it well. Maybe they said, well, you have to come to the next five city council meetings and do this and do that. And it just felt like it was too complicated and it was too hard to participate. But maybe that 30 grand should have been spent to, you know, fix a sewer problem. I don't know that there are government exists for a reason to make policy decisions and the ability of citizens to step outside of it is both in many ways exciting, opens up a ton of opportunity. Uh, I, I don't want to discourage it at all, but it also raises some questions about how communities set priorities, how they make decisions about things. Um, and I think it also has real implications for justice in this country, because if we move to like a Kickstarter crowdfunded model for playgrounds, then <coughs> poor neighborhoods are going to get screwed, you know? Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's a very practical example of how I see the mob, the, you know, how I see that being disruptive. There, there are others that are way more terrifying, but that's a relatively boring one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Um, my, uh, I'll, I'll come back to my more substantive question, but I just want to make an offering with respect to your observations about uh, education. Obviously, the classic uh, traditional face-to-face -face model that most of us have grown up with is uh, very appealing and has a lot to offer that cannot be replicated directly in the massive online course uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> but I'd like to offer an observation, maybe some of you all in the room know about it, that uh, helps tease this out, I think. And, and that is, my wife is a surgeon, and she periodically has to take requalifying exams that relate to those initials that annoyingly show up after doctors' names, uh, forgotten what they all are. But they're high stakes professional exams because they have to do with whether or not she's going to be allowed to cut you open or not. Uh, so they're a big deal, and they're, they're done in a way, at least one of them is, that uh, she enrolls for an online course, a prep course, similar to what one does for the bar exam, goes through that, takes the course when she's comfortable that she's ready for it. Then she goes to a uh, third floor office in some downtown office building in, in Boston and goes to a little uh, cubicle and sits down and turns on a computer. She has to take all the stuff out of her pockets and so forth so she can't cheat. And then on a computer, she is ad administered an exam that says yes or no, whether she gets to renew these credentials, high stakes stuff. Sitting next to her is someone who's doing the same thing with respect to engineering or architecture or some other high stakes credential that matters a lot. So that suggests to me that the, that the uh, if you will, the, the colder model uh, that is related to the massive online course phenomenon has potential to be uh, integrated successfully with the warmer model that you just referred to in terms of the, the, the enrichment element of, of, of teaching. And it illustrates something that, that I've felt. I, I do some part-time college teaching. I, I believe we need to recognize that there's a kind of a fundamental conflict of interest, at least in some extent, in a model where the same individual does both the teaching and the grading because one then has the capability to grade on a scale that can uh, submerge the recognition that the teaching is not very good. And when those elements are separated, then you, there's no temptation to that because somebody else is, is doing that. Well, I would say just two things because now you have another question, but uh, one of the things you're raising is that there are actually different kinds of education, right? That different models may serve differently. Right. And the second thing is, I'll tell you just two quick stories. One is that I, Khan's Academy is this guy started this thing to tutor kids online. And I was having, I was reading something and realizing what a, what a poor, vague memory of high school calculus I had. And I just wanted to like, I don't know, take a refresher. And I found myself paired with a tutor online. And I actually had a great experience doing this refresher thing. And so I, I don't want to totally um, dismiss that like online education can be enormously powerful, especially to populations that might never get served, right. that might never have the opportunity to go to college. You know, it's, a, it's an enormously powerful vehicle for education. So as a little too harsh maybe on, on MOOCs before, they have enormous power and potential. Um, and I'll tell you one other thing is there's a, a site I love, meetup.com. And... Um, 
one of the best meetups is they have foreign language meetups if you want to learn how to speak a foreign language. And you can go show up at a Spanish or French or Mandarin or, you know, meetup. And, and, and it's, it's, like, it's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic way to learn how to speak. You mean typing or by voice? Like, you go to meetup.com, you like, put up like your Skype? zip code, and it says, oh, oh Thursday oh, oh. night, Thursday night at the local community library, there's a Spanish meetup, so you can learn how to speak Spanish. It's, you know, it's a very interesting way of doing that. Absolutely. Uh, my, my main question is partly overlaps the, the input of the, the young woman who uh, just uh, spoke earlier. You, you've given us a lot of material that I think really well illustrates uh, the rise of the small, in other words, uh, information empowerment uh, activities and so forth that, that uh, much distribute the capability of individuals to do things and participate in ways that were largely concentrated and much more uh, exclusively available to, uh, to big entities in the past. And that's obviously a, a very significant thing and probably is going to have a huge role in uh, in a distributive way, increasing the quality of life. Um, but in terms of the title of the book, The End of Big, you, earlier it was spoken about uh, in terms of the, the, the big entities that you used as examples. Fair enough, some of those may be transitory. Uh, but with respect to certain kinds of power, and here I'm thinking mostly about political power, I don't think any of us are feeling too comfortable that big is going to get out of our lives in terms of its excessive influence on the political structure, at least the elements of formal yeah. government. And that's kind of what I thought you were going to be addressing with respect to the book. I apologize if I missed it, but maybe you can illuminate so, us about that. So uh, I, talk a little, I talk a little bit about that in the book. And the way I see it is as long as, you know, like I don't know if you saw this thing last week that the banking bill that passed in the Senate was almost verbatim, two paragraphs, two full paragraphs, the crucial paragraphs verbatim. It was like something like 72 of 86 lines in the bill were verbatim what Citigroup asked them to be, okay? And, you know, uh, we, I don't know anything about that bill, but I don't know, that doesn't smell quite right to me. Uh, and so there's no doubt that there are very big uh, interests that have disproportionate influence on our political process. And I, uh, I think that's enormously, uh, that's like a serious problem. Uh, but but I, I think what's gonna happen is that people are simply going to use, what I say in my book, my argument is, people are gonna use the technology to just opt out and create alternative systems. That those systems are gonna get so big, that, that those systems are so big and feel so hard to move and I have all this technology, I'll just do my own thing, right? Uh, I this think- This would be the Bitcoin approach to- The Bitcoin, you know, alternative uh, currencies. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, and is that a crazy idea? Yeah, but I also see, you know, you know uh, we have, uh, you know, <laughs> turnout in local elections across the United States is like single digit. Okay, so we're looking at a situation where really nobody votes uh, and um, we don't have local newspapers to hold power accountable anymore. We, we have this just, th th these institutions are just not working. And I think, that, um, I think that rather than try and figure out how to reform those systems, a lot of people are choosing to opt out and create new ones. And that is very exciting and totally terrifying by equal measure. Um, so I don't mean to diminish the role or the impact of, we got some big things going on, no doubt, but their, their uh, long-term viability, you know, to just totally destroy and appropriate a historical quote. The arc of history, the arc of technology, the arc of technology is long, but it bends towards small, right? That in the, in the short term, it's gonna feel like some of these very big entities like big banks have disproportionate control. But when I look at, when I look at what's happening with money, boy, I don't, I don't know that I wanna be a credit card company. You know, I haven't, I haven't paid for, I haven't used a credit card 
in um, uh, my I, I work a lot in Davis Square, and there's two or three different alternative um, f systems you can use to pay with your phone. Like one's called Level Up, um, and you know I'm not I'm not using my Visa or Mastercard. <laughs> They're bypassing bypassing a giant chunk of the financial of the financial infrastructure, and I think the technology actually opens up that as a possibility. I'm not going to deny it's pretty small right now, but it is a major possibility, and I think the cat is out of the bag. It's pretty hard to put it back in. For yeah, for now, but the, I don't. I'm 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 optimistic about the. I'm less worried about Apple. I'm a lot more worried about AT&T and Verizon. Uh, but even that, I have a, in my book, I talk about potential for mesh networking. The, 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 the vast trajectory and speed and direction and velocity and push of the technology is to the individual and away from, the instit away from any centralized power, away from centralized mobile phone towers, away from everything. The absolute direction of the technology is to the individual. And so that, that's going to take a few decades to play out. That's, the big is not going to go away without a fight, believe me. <laughs> but the, but I'm, very, uh, I'm very confident about the, the, the course of history. You can wanna, find me in 25 years and figure out if I'm wrong. <laughs> hmm. I want to make sure we get to everyone's question, and we actually do have a couple by Twitter as well. Oh, great. Then why don't we take a Twitter one, and then we'll take yours next. Okay. We have a two-part question, and I said I'd keep it anonymous, so I will. Um, one part is, um, I'd like Nico to speak about the role of alternative infrastructures. Is there political value in peer-to-peer? -peer? And then part two is, what are examples of political systems or processes of governance, even at the local level, changing with information technologies? Hmm. So number one, there absolutely is a real political value to peer-to-peer. But it's, it is mostly undiscovered country right now. And number two, examples of it are, are actually relatively rare. I mean, I don't know if you have any that come to mind. It's, but the, um, you know, there's a fascinating thing in Europe, the Pirate Party, which I talk about briefly in my book, which has a online system for peer-to-peer -peer deliberation. But broadly speaking, there's this thing, it's called Goodwin's Law. And Goodwin's law says that in any online discussion, given enough time, someone will be compared to Hitler. Yes. And if I can um, um, fact check you on that, it's actually Godwin's law. Godwin's I've seen law. Seen that much Sorry. on the internet. Excellent, <clears throat> excellent. Godwin's law. So, um, I and I think there is something inherent about there's something fascinating, dynamic to online discussion that that seems to lend itself towards <clears throat> um, <clears throat> towards you know hyperventilation and 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 kind of uh, lends itself away from moderation sort of. uh, uh, yeah. so i think uh that that presents a challenge in practical applications of peer-to-peer -peer technology for navigating process in local meetings and in government and uh, it's an exciting challenge. It's one I hope we take on. I hope Code for America takes on. You know, I think there's there's interesting experiments, but I would say we're a long way from solving that one. But that's exciting. And actually, I have another um, example, but we're going to have to look up the name because I don't remember what it's <laughs> called. Where in um, some countries in Africa where they're creating new laws and new new governments, there's actually a way to, with technology, check the, uh, the written laws and other infrastructure of other, other governments nearby, hmm. in similar to GitHub, how you can check out uh, someone else's code and take a look at it. They have, this, they have this technology, but I'm blanking on the name of it right now, so maybe we can. I, don't, I think one of the most pop, powerful collaborative things is simple, it's old, it's email, group emails. Like I say, Google Groups and Yahoo Groups is like the fundamental community structure of the United States and probably other countries. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if it has to be complicated. That's a good example. I, I thought of that because um, I was thinking about uh, 
the way the way a lot of groups share legislation in different in different ways uh like if a lo if a locality if a locality passes say hate crime legislation there are uh there are google groups of local legislators ever that share different resolutions and approaches to problem solving it's very casual and ad hoc but it actually works relatively well Wait, well, why don't we take your question and then next we'll take the second one from Twitter. Or, oh, we have another real life question, so we'll take yours real first, <laughs> your second, and then if there's time, go back to the internet. Good evening, my name is Dale. I guess everyone else is at the Bruins game. You can tell he's not a Bruins fan, they're not drunk enough. <laughs> Except maybe one. Uh, when you brought up Meetup, that was a great segue up there because uh, I, that was what I wanted to talk about. I don't know if you know the story, and I haven't read the bit book yet about how a dean's use of meetup i was i was there yeah, I, yeah it's in, it's in the book my first experience at howard dean was a meetup the the essex lounge meetup in new york city in march of 2003. The, when i got involved in 07 i had remembered hearing this but i couldn't remember where and i relate quite often when i talk to people about meetup because i'm, I'm an enthusiastic meetup attendee what, and what kind of meetups do you go to you name it What's you your favorite? Well, I, I sing karaoke a lot now because of a karaoke meetup. I went Fantastic. To yeah, it's been a great experience. I had a real estate investing meetup for a while and a, and a comedy meetup for a while, which got me doing stand-up comedy for a while. I stood up comedy seldom, seldom ensued. But the, the, you know, the story of it is, is fascinating because it really, I believe, more than anything else, brought politics to the internet. They realized, because the story always was, who the hell is Howard Dean and how did he get to the front of the pack? And then they'd say meet up. Yeah. And when I met Scott, the I CEO, that, the founder. Yeah. Uh, Richard Rowe was with him, who was a consultant, yeah. media yeah. consultant from the area. And when Scott had to go back early, Robert took over and he was, had a great deal more rapport. And I spoke to him a little bit because the Deval Patrick campaign was going on at the time. And I said, why doesn't Deval Patrick have a meetup. He said, we consulted with us, but it would have been too expensive to have all of these, but they used the model. And my feeling about people getting more involved with things, I believe in Toastmasters and all these different groups. And I do believe there is a new arising of people. People want to get their voice heard. And Obama won because of the ground game. Warren won because of the ground game, and Maki's going to win because of the ground game. The people they have out there in the field, and a lot of it has to do with these meetup type of models, with communicating with people, letting them know where they can be. It's not all these phone trees and all yeah. that stuff like that. Yeah. I, mean, I think meetups are a good example. When I was talking before about new institutions, people opting out and just creating new, using technology to create new institutions, that's in a sense what meetup is. And I can just give you in two minutes the kind of brief history of Meetup, which is Thank you. this organization, you know, some of you may be familiar with um, Putnam, uh, Bob Pub Robert Putnam is a professor at Harvard of government, and he wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And I'm sure there are people in the audience who know it better than me and will 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 have a problem with the way I'm going to characterize it now, but I'm just trying to do it briefly, so just give me the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> which is that in some sense in American political science, the holy grail is why do so Amer few Americans vote? And part of Putnam's argument is, well, Americans don't vote because they there's no social capital. They don't feel connected to their communities. And he did this study and showed that there's roughly the same number of Americans bowling today as 50 years ago, but Americans today bowl alone, and 50 years ago, everybody bowled in a league. And so that's why the title of the book is Bowling Alone. And he... He kind of tracks how we begin bu building air conditioners into our houses and we buy TVs and we stop building front porches and we stop going to bowling leagues and, um, and we lose connections to our community. That's a gross oversimplification, but that's the essential argument. And um, the found founder meetup, Scott Heiferman, was this nerd technologist after September 11th who had been in startup land and was inspired by this book, wanted a way to create social capital, to create community. And so he started meetup.com where you can go. I've been to, um, I've been to a whole, besides Dean meetups, I've also been to tea party meetups. I'm equal opportunity. I went to a uh, dad's dogs and babies meetup. 
I've been to a lot of a lot of technology meetups. Uh, I've been to foreign language meetups, Spanish, trying to learn how to speak Spanish. So you know, meetup is this enormously fascinating, powerful uh, new kind of emerging system or institution that. I actually think is a kind of political infrastructure. Even though you're going to karaoke meetups, you're getting to know the names of other people in your community. And that that's, you know, that that takes us back to the old New England tradition of the town hall meeting, right? And so that's a really exciting that's a really exciting development. We just need more. And how are we doing on time and Twitter questions. We all, always want to take all the questions. Uh, we're doing all right on time. We, we don't have other questions on Twitter. We've got at least one right here, and I don't know if anyone, and we've got one over there. So uh, this right here, go okay. ahead. Well, I have, I have two questions. The first is getting back to your comment about Level Up being an alternative. Um, I'd spent some time in Sweden, and they're much more technologically forward. They're much smaller than us, and they're universally more technologically forward than we are. You can walk up to a Coke machine and punch in the code on your cell phone, and it charges the Coke to your phone and gives you the Coke. All we're really moving towards is replacing the credit card companies with the telephone companies. I mean, somebody has to do the billing. and. It's just one monster for another, so. Well, I think for now it is, but the argument I make in my book is that there actually are lots of more emergent peer-to-peer -peer alternatives that reject the notion that you need any kind of big authority to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And there's, lo there's lots of interesting stuff happening in this, in this space. So sure, there's a risk that the big will simply, a new big will replace you the should. old big. Yeah. But like I said, I, I, don't th I think people don't want that, really. I think people are broadly suspicious of that, for the most part, with good reason. Right. And there's a hunger and desire for alternatives that, that exist, that, uh, that have integrity, that are, are, worth, are worth pursuing. Mm. You know, interesting, uh, not to go back to Meetup, but there's incredible stories out of I'm, I'm developing an, an obsession with Meetup because it feels like such a significant under the radar part of the future of the country and even in the areas of commerce and community, right? Um, so I, 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 I agree there's the danger that we're just going to replace the bank with the phone company. I mean, you know, if we really want to get freaked out about it, there's essentially four companies that control the bulk of Internet access in the country, like the, the actual cables, you know, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, and Time Warner. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's disturbing, mm -hmm. but uh, I really, I really think that the more they're going to try and consolidate their power and be, uh, and be hegemonic about it, the more people are going to seek alternatives. And the big message I have for you is that the internet allows those alternatives. Not, the internet's such a bad word because it doesn't really encompass what we're talking about. It just tells you we don't have good ways of thinking about this. It's not really the internet. It's not really mobile phones. In my book, I talk about it as I try and coin a term radical connectivity, but I don't even like that word. But the technology pushes this power to individuals so that if you don't like dealing with the big companies, there's lots of alternatives. You could even start one. Um, and th that, that is, that's what's powerful. That's what's different. We My need to go, I'm sorry, oh. we need to go to one last question, if you, unless you have a follow-up. There was, yep. a, there was yeah. a second part to that. The, the second part is the quality of the information. When, when I first started working, which was more years ago than I like to recount, I was in computers. And we used to say, if somebody has a question, just put a computer printout in front of them, they'll believe it. And, and they did. You know, I mean, people say, oh, the computer did that, it must be right. People go on the internet and they, re and they look something up and they take the first thing that they come across that they like. And that becomes yeah. a fact. And, and there's no depth or quality of research that goes into the way they answer a lot of these questions, which I think gets to this. Yeah. It's the power of the in individual, but it's mob sentimentality. Oh, I like the way that sounds, so I'm going to believe that. We used to be able to put our confidence and faith in people like uh, Walter Cronkite, know that he had researched something and we could listen to his pros and cons. It's all gone now. So You, you know, know. I, and the chapter on big universities is not called big universities, it's called big minds. Because I think the issue is really about knowledge and expertise, 
right, of which education and teaching is one piece about the question of knowledge and expertise. And yeah, I think the internet is not kind to traditional expertise. And that's a mixed bag. I, 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 in the book, I talk about some academic research into people Googling medical conditions before they go in to see their doctor. And, you know, <laughs> I've done that. And <laughs> certainly my anxiety level is skyrocketing. Um, and so I, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right that if we, uh, as, a, as a society, we haven't really figured out what we want out of authority. We haven't figured out what we want out of authority slash expertise. And uh, increasingly, we feel like we've been betrayed by it. This, you know, the example we had about the, you know, the New York Times and George Bush and me repeating that story is, is a good example about that, about ways we don't entirely trust uh, traditional authority anymore. And we have to figure out a way, we have to figure out a way to build back up some authority and credibility because I think it's in a, an essential part of, um, an essential part of trust and essential part of democracy. Um, Not everybody's capable of doing the kind of research they need to do to, to know how to answer a question. Oh, I agree. I'm not arguing that they should. I'm just saying that the problem right now is not that people don't know how to do that research, although I do think that's a problem. Um, but I, I think the problem is also that they don't, um, the, the people, there's well-established, a big PR firm, Edelman, has something called their trust index. People don't trust really any authority. Nico, we need to uh, wrap Sorry. up and take that one last question. Sorry. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. I'm Dawn. I just wanted to say a couple things. First of all, I think Barack Obama won because we were looking for our first black president. 2009 was the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth in 1809. I think it has a lot to do with that, much more so than, say, the game of politics. Um, second, you talked about Arlington, about building the playground. Where I come from in Groton, Connecticut, there were many people who wanted to do sports facilities, and they were willing to put their money and say, we want to do this. And the Groton authorities said, well, if we're not going to be in charge of it, we're not even going to allow you to do that. So you should be very happy with Arlington being allowing you to do that. They're taking the money and agreeing to build the slides right, right away. That's absolutely. absolutely true. You should be happy with that. That's absolutely true. Um, the one thing I wanted to say is that I feel very personally that with all this internet stuff, it's a very bullying situation. I'm going to be a real outlier. I don't do computers. I stay away from them. Now try to get thing, anything done without doing computers now. It's a very bullying situation. You talked about getting a Coke out of a a vending machine, excuse me, I've got money in my pocket. I'd like to give it to a vendor and get the Coke myself. I really don't want to deal with all this machinery. Thank you very much. And ma'am, there's a slide you had up there. Would you please put it back up there? I believe it was Louis Van On. Yeah. Um, could you tell me um, what the quote was? Or it was about uh, you could get 100,000 people together. Yeah. Just a second. And then while she's bringing that up, what, what's your specific question? Well, it's not a question so much as something that I've thought about this and that quote really brings it home. If you really want to look at that quote, think of it a little bit in terms of Genesis and building the Tower of Babel. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Um, last yeah. words here? Yeah, do you have any closing, closing thoughts? Thank you, you've been a very generous <laughs> audience letting me talk at great length.